Welcome to Prime Minister Li uh, Senlong. Uh, Prime Minister Li, it's a great honor for us uh, to have you here. The story of your country is remarkable. As uh, you know, uh, Singapore gained its uh, independence in 1965, the year I was born, nearly 55 years ago. Since then, it has grown from a small British trading colony to one of the more world's most sophisticated economies in the span of a generation. Back in 1965, per capita in Singapore was 500 US dollars. Today, per capita is 65,000 US dollars. That uh, represents, I guess, around 9% annual growth. You became a prime minister in 2004. You are the third prime minister of your country. Also shows the stability and um, have been leading no, the country for 16 years. We know that uh, there is a lot of uh, things happening in the region, but this is definitely Asia century. For the first time, 50% of the global GDP is coming from Asia, and Singapore's leadership is crucial. So I think all the people coming here, uh, looking forward to hear uh, your views, Mr. Prime Minister, on the geopolitical outlook, aspirations for Singapore. Floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you, Brimley. Uh, thank you for your very generous remarks on Singapore. We've done reasonably well over the last half century. We worked hard for that, but there were some external factors which were very important to us, and I'll just mention three of them the United States, China, and globalization. The United States was critical because it generated peace and stability and security throughout the Asia Pacific over this last half century. The Vietnam War notwithstanding, it has been a benign constructive influence, generating an environment where countries like Singapore, small ones, can participate and prosper and compete and have our place in the sun. At the same time, the United States was also a major source of investments and a major market for us because they kept the economy open and they believe that by being open and by being welcoming of the growth and prosperity of others, the US gained. China also was a major factor in our success, because over the last 40 years as China reformed and opened up and grew steadily even faster than Singapore, um, our engagement with them deepened. Um, trade volumes increased dramatically, uh, investments in China grew hugely. Singapore, according to the Chinese statistics, is the biggest source of foreign investments in China through Singapore. I think some of them must be other companies based in Singapore, but nevertheless, it shows the depth of the relationship. Tourism numbers grew. The engagement generated confidence, lift, and a certain vibrancy throughout the whole region, which Singapore benefited hugely from. Thirdly, we benefited from globalization because world trade was buoyant, and because people did business with one another, uh, increasingly openly, there, was a, there were trade rounds, there was a Uruguay round. Um, the WTO played a constructive role, although not always effortlessly. But we plugged into the global economy and that enabled a small country to be productive. And so the policies we made could work. Now we are at a turning point. All three of these factors are changing. The United States, in terms of security, I think um, the security balance, strategic balance in the region is shifting because China has become more influential and more substantial a participant. And other countries too, I mean, the North Koreans are a major preoccupation because they have nuclear capabilities. And America itself, 
is asking the question whether they are carrying too much of a burden for this and pushing, wanting the allies to take on more of a responsibility, at least for financing the cost of this common security. On economics too, the Americans have shifted their attitudes. I think there's much more concern about impact on American workers, much more concern about other countries taking advantage of America, seeing this as a free rider problem rather than one where America is holding the ring and uh, being open, benefiting others, but in the process benefiting itself. So that is a major change. We don't know that it is irreversible, but it is certainly a very fundamental shift of stance. The Chinese position has also shifted because as they have grown, they have become much more uh, influential, much more advanced in their development. Their role in the international uh, economy has changed substantially. Their influence has grown and their relations with other countries and in particular with the United States has become um, more difficult to manage. And therefore, whereas it was previously effortless to say I'm friends with everybody and including friends with the United States and with China, now we still want to be friends with everybody, but you are pushed to be better friends with one side or the other. <laughs> so that's a change I in the world. I think a lot of Europeans understand uh, that. Uh, well, <laughs> the smaller you are, the better you understand it. Uh, the third factor, globalization, is also shifting. You, you discuss it all the time here because uh, people worry about the impact on um, disadvantaged groups. People worry about the impact on the environment. People worry about the uncertainties which generate, which are generated because we are so interrelated. And people are anxious about the ups and downs which we no longer have a buffer to protect ourselves against. And in this environment, Singapore has to look forward for more than another 50 years and find a way forward to navigate them. What do we do? With America, we remain very good friends. They are a major, secu major security cooperation partner with us. And I think we continue to believe that they have an important role in the region to foster stability and security. No longer alone, but still an indispensable role. Because the Chinese cannot play the role the Americans do, the Japanese neither. And so we would like to continue to work with America, we'd like to continue to work with China. From time to time, you will find yourself being pressed to choose sides. And when we do have to make a stand, I think it's very important that people understand that Singapore's choices are on its own behalf because we are making decisions for Singapore and not because we are a cat's paw for one side or the other. And that means you must have the courage to stand up and call things as they are and from time to time you will incur, well, uh, at least a raised eyebrow and sometimes more than one raised eyebrow from one side or the other and occasionally both. But it's necessary to do that because once people no longer think that you're a serious interlocutor calculating on your own behalf, you are written off your finish. With China, we also have a big account. Uh, in fact, China is our biggest trading partner as it is for everybody else in the region, including all of America's allies. And we hope when we see that it is possible for China to adjust its position, taking into account its new very strong influence in the world in order to integrate in a peaceful and constructive way into the global order, which it depends upon. Uh, whether it is through the uh, One Belt, Belt and Road Initiative, whether it's through the uh, Asia Infrastructure and Investment Bank or other diplomatic initiatives, I think China will have a major role to play. And Singapore hopes that we'll be able to cooperate with them and participate and encourage them to engage in a way which leaves space for other countries to prosper, to set their own path, and in the long term to welcome a new major player and not feel 
that this is an elephant in the room which may not notice who else is there and what may be underfoot. Uh, on globalization, I think notwithstanding the pressures and the problems, uh, we have no choice but to continue to bet on countries cooperating closely with one another. Because if five and a half million or six million people in Singapore have to grow our own food and make our own computers and make our own banking and living, I think we will starve. It is not possible. But to prosper in such a new globalized but troubled environment, we have to up our game, raise our capabilities, bring in new investments which will connect us to centers of vibrancy and prosperity all over the world. Europe, America, Japan, China, Latin America and Africa because there are many spots of uh, uh, vibrancy and, 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 and future growth there. And link us in in a way where we make a contribution because we can do things in Singapore which is not so easy to be done all together in one place, any other single place. And that means we have to upgrade our companies, upgrade our people, education, skills, and have the environment where we can welcome in very high quality investments, operations, R&D centers, places where high quality people want to live, want to work, want to be. And it's not just costs, but it's also the whole environment, the safety, the security, the confidence, the opportunities, the vibrancy. That is what Singapore needs to be. And amidst all this, we have to look after our own people. Make sure that all these good things which happen in the world benefit not just Singapore, but benefit Singaporeans across the board so that they are able to take advantage of the jobs we create, so that they are able to fend for themselves against global competition, so that if one industry is declining, which will happen from time to time, the people there are given the help and the support and the time to gain new skills and transfer their employment to another industry, another job, and be able to make a living for themselves and not feel that they are fending for themselves on their own and that the system is not on their side. This system has to work for them because if it doesn't work for them, the system will fail. And in Singapore, it must not fail because we only have one chance to succeed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. Thank you very much for this uh, tour de horizon. There's so many uh, questions that could be raised. Let me uh, start with uh, the global risk report that the World Economic Forum uh, does every year. Um, the top concern uh, by experts and business leaders in the survey that we just published last week, uh, short term, was geopolitical polarization and trade wars having also a negative impact on global growth. IMF uh, came up, out with their adjusted uh, numbers uh, for global growth um, this uh, year and um, were uh, more bearish uh, than in the last report. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, um, do you feel that um, there is still uh, challenges uh, related to geopolitical uh, confrontations and competition? Or do you see that uh, we maybe it has peaked uh, with the signing of uh, the first part of the trade agreement by US and uh, China in DC last week? Uh, we are relentlessly, relentlessly optimistic, but not that much so. No. <laughs> I don't think it has peaked at all. It's a very serious issue. How does an incumbent hyperpower, the United States, accommodate a rising new power, China, which is going to grow as a percentage of the world GDP, which is going to grow and develop in terms of the sophistication of its economy, and which in absolute size is going to become larger than, than the United States, although not more advanced than the US, for many years to come. But it will become larger very soon, if it is not already. And 
how do, how do both sides make the adjustments in order to accommodate each other and head off what Graham Allison calls the Thucydides trap? And it's not at all obvious that it is easy to do because both sides have domestic pressures. Those, both sides primarily are calculating the next election or the next domestic political succession. And those domestic pressures do not naturally factor in a global, strategic, stable balance. So already you see the consequences because the tariffs, the counter-tariffs have uh, reduced trade, has reduced welfare, and the uncertainty of the conflict has meant that investments have been affected and business decisions are being put off because you don't know, you can't count on the future. And the prospect of um, bifurcation in technology, whether it's on 5G or on the whole supply chain, that will cause, I don't trust you, therefore you don't trust me, therefore I cannot rely on your products and therefore you must develop your own supply chain. It's a, it will take a long time for that process to come to, fru to, to, to run its course but it's a very expensive process which is going to hurt us. I was talking to one uh, industrialist yesterday and he said, well, we make, say, medical equipment, MRI machines. In an ideal world, you make it in one place and you supply the whole world. If we bifurcate, we can put one manufacturing center for Asia and China, one manufacturing center for America. And well, it'll cost us some, but we won't die. I said, that's fine if you're making the same MRI machine in both places. But if they need different chips and different software, and if the next time I find an MRI breakthrough, I'm not going to share with you, because that's a national security threat to me, then I think it will cost us. And I think you're not there yet, but you're not heading away from that direction. Mr. Prime Minister, um you're right that uh, G2, also uh, called that, uh, US and China is more than 40% of the global GDP. So it really matters um, what is coming out of that uh, cooperation or competition. Yes. I, I feel also uh, that it is also a competition about the new technologies yes. following the fourth industrial revolution. Yes. I guess both Beijing and DC has understood that those countries that are on top of these technologies will also come out of this century as some of the most influential Yes. Ones. How worried are you, and you already touched on it, uh, this decoupling piece? Because uh, today uh, they have been competing, but if you go for different systems and uh, you don't follow um, uh, a path uh, where this is uh, compatible, that can also have a quite significant negative impact on long-term uh, growth and then countries will have to choose. Uh, Singapore has then to choose the, the Chinese system or, or the American uh, system and I think Europe can easily well, end up in the same well, dilemma. Today I'm here talking to you, we have two mics for backup and they're both the same system. <laughs> one day I may need to have one which is an American system and one which is not an American system. And I don't think that's a better world to be in because it's not just that it's going to cost us more, but the mutual suspicions and the uh, anxieties which is going to be created. Did he design his own? Did he borrow my design? Did he reverse engineer mine? Or did he entice my person over in order to uh, carry the IP along inside his brain? All these mutual suspicions and doubts are going only to create more frictions, more problems. The optimists say that you're so integrated that pulling it apart is unthinkable. But I, I don't take quite such an optimistic view. I think it makes it very hard. But such things do happen before. And if you do try to happen, the consequences are very, very, very bad. Mm. I mean, before the First World War, the European countries were all very integrated together. The economies were integrated together. The colonies traded with one another. And people thought this was the future, this globalization. But that didn't stop miscalculations and tensions from building up and the First World War from breaking out disastrously, beginning with what should have been a minor incident. 
And so we've had 50 years generally of peace. Can you bet on another 50 years generally of peace? I think that the odds are not negligible. A lot at stake, so we're moving from like a prosper thy neighbor to a beggar thy neighbor approach, huh? Well, nobody says that. Everybody says, I want to prosper my neighbor, but I have to think about my people first. Um, Singapore already saw last year um, quite a significant slowdown in your growth. I think you had 0.7%. Yes. You're more optimistic about this year and the hit last year. Were you paying a price already for this uh, trade wars? And uh, Some of it was from slower trade. Export markets were less buoyant. Some of it was because of uh, electronic slowdown, which was global. There are some prospects the electronic slowdown will uh, turn around this year. The, the people in the industry are reasonably optimistic. What we are not sure this year is where the US economy is going. Um, doesn't look like it is going into a recession, but nobody has a very good record predicting when the economy is going to recession. A lot of numbers last day, uh, yesterday you heard probably from President Trump, very positive. Oh, numbers. yes, I have no doubt, but uh, does that predict the future? <laughs> and you never know. It's the turning point, when does the mood change and all of a sudden the people's perspectives shift and say, how silly of me, why didn't I see this before? And by that time, everybody else has gotten into a new, new psychology and uh, things turn. It may not happen this year. If you ask the best opinion, they say chances are not, but the chances are not negligible. But the key thing is, if you have the st strategic tensions not being resolved and flaring up again downstream, which can happen, then it's not just an impact on the business cycle, it's an impact on the long-term trajectory of the world. We are witnessing a kind of synchronized global economic slowdown, but we are not seeing any kind of recession at this point. But if there is a recession in the coming years, how worried would you be that we have so limited uh, tools to fight the recession? Uh, you know, can you have more than zero uh, interest rate? You can, of course, go a little bit uh, further with quantitative easing. Uh, how much of a um, fiscal muscle is there uh, globally when many countries are already uh, running with big deficits. And what was the lesson learned from 2008? G20 came together and agreed on very unorthodox tools. Would it be possible to get the same players in the same room and agree on anything these days? Well, that depends on your view, whether things have turned sour because people have, the relationship has soured, or whether they work less well together because the crisis is less urgent. If it is the former and you're going to a crisis and we are not on good terms, well, we have a problem, we can't cooperate. But if we are squabbling because things are not grave, then when things become grave and minds are concentrated, perhaps we'll have no choice but to work together again. I have to hope so. Yeah. I don't know whether central bankers have run out of ammunition, they say so, but central banks are not the only policy instrument which governments have, you also have fiscal policy. And there are limits, but in fact, there are very respectable and eminent economists like Larry Summers who argued that in the last downturn and in the recovery, uh, fiscal policy was not used enough. And people were too worried about running deficits, whereas you should have run the deficits, spent the money wisely, not just to feel good or to boondoggle, but to invest in infrastructure, education, things which make a difference, improve your productive capacity, and then the economy will recover, and then, in a way, you've got something of a free lunch. Mm. I don't generally believe in a free lunch, but I do believe there's a role for fiscal policy. Mm. And there are countries that still have huge fiscal muscles, though. Quite large economies, well, aren't there? Uh, Germany, for example, has got a very balanced budget, but they have very deep institutional and uh, collective memories of hyperinflation, and they, they do not wish to go in that direction. They have the Schwarzenegger in the law, the zero, black zero. Well, that's, 
that's not a bad discipline to impose on ourselves. I mean, in a way, Singapore has that rule too, not year by year, but term by term of government. Namely, that this government, if you are going to run a deficit, you have first to earn the money. Then the next year, you can run a deficit. But you cannot say last term of government ran a surplus, and so I can now afford to run a deficit. The country is rich. And I think if it, that's a valuable uh, discipline, but you have to apply it in a way which is appropriate to the situation. Mr. President. And I think the 2007-2008 economic crisis, that global financial crisis, in that situation, if you navigate by rules, the chances are you will run into an a even more serious problem. And maybe if there are no tools and no agreements, you could run into a situation, maybe not with such a deep recession, but a much longer one like we had in the 70s that or, was or very in, or, meager growth. Or in the 30s, because what happened in the 30s was um, tariffs and counter-tariffs and smooth, ha smooth hawley in, uh, in, 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 in America. And one of the things that G20 did after the global financial crisis was to say, we shall not go for this tariff retaliation or competitive devaluation. And we shall be in this together. Let's try to reflate together. Let's bring our monetary policy down and try and coordinate that. And you do need that kind of coordination worldwide. We can't all be running uh, trade surpluses. <coughs> Whom are we going to be having surpluses against? Antarctica. <laughs> Well, thank you also for reminding us about uh, the history. Uh, we, we, we do remember uh, from the uh, history books is that in the 30s, the global trade fell with 50%. Yes. And the global GDP in a few years fell with 20, 25%, yeah. and we got a real depression. So there is a lot at stake. Followed by a war. Yeah. There is a lot at stake. I mean, I don't think we will repeat our follies in the same way, but it is quite possible for us to be inventive in making new mistakes. <laughs> Do you see any silver linings? <laughs> well, if you look at the tech sector, there's tremendous vibrancy and optimism, and everybody believes they're going to change the world. They are not all right, but some of them will not be wrong. And if you look at things like um, you know, Google or Amazon or so many of the tech companies or Microsoft, which did not exist 30 years ago and which were not dominant 20 years ago, they are now major players in the world. So nobody knows what the major participants are going to be 20 years from now. And it's going to generate new opportunities, but it's also going to ge generate new problems. When social media came along, everybody said this is marvelous, this is a way to democratize that debate, and everybody has a voice, and now, uh, we shall have um, an egalitarian, uh, participative, uh, uh, basically, nirvana will have arrived. <laughs> and now we see what it is like. It doesn't look like nirvana. Can democracy survive social media? I do not know whether it's democracy surviving, but how will human societies adapt to this? Human societies, I mean, over many, many centuries, have developed to have a certain, to have circuit breakers. Mm -hmm. I mean, a view, an idea develops, it catches fire, a few more people pick it up, it gets tested, other people may or may not pick it up. Things take time. Gradually, evidence <coughs> accumulates, and then some fail, some succeed, and you move forward. Now all that is short-circuited into one fraction of a second, at length of time it presses your button, time to press a button for either a Facebook post or a Twitter tweet. And when you speed up the operating cycle like that by a hundred or a thousand or ten thousand times, the operating system will malfunction. Human beings are not meant to work like that. Your brain doesn't speed up ten thousand times. You need time to hoist things in, to mull it over, to think it to, to think it, discuss it, to test it, and gradually to get some gray hair, and then you have some better decision about it. <laughs> and if you throw all that out of the window, I think you need to be very confident you know what you're doing. And I'm not sure that we actually have an answer to that question. 
these uh, platform companies um, scale and size is everything when it, uh, the winner takes it all in a platform economy. H who do you think uh, smaller uh, countries and medium-sized economies will, will cope with this? Uh, if we can participate in the global economy, then we are part of it. I mean, in Singapore, we have a lot of the, the major platform companies are all in Singapore. Google is there, Facebook is there, um, the, the, the data centers are there, the engineers are there. We are not, we don't have very many unicorns of our own, but we are part of the global economy and part of these major participants. And if there are proper rules which protect participants, big and small, in this environment, then I think uh, we make a living. If there are no rules and all of a sudden you have a Twitter storm or something befalls you in the middle of the night, next morning you wake up and you find you've been devastated. It can happen. Prime Minister, thank you so much. I think I'm, I'm speaking on um, behalf of all the participants. I would have loved to continue another 50 minutes to get um, your insights, but uh, everything good also has to come to an end. Uh, thank you uh, so much um, for joining us, and thank you for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you.